India is a resplendent mosaic of myriad colors and dazzling diversity. The fairs and festivals celebrated in harmony with changing seasons are fascinating. This diversity is the greatest strength of our nation. People of different faiths have lived in peace and amity through millennia. Communities, small in size, have not felt threatened and have enriched the lives of their compatriots. While rituals, theologies and institutions might vary from religion to religion, the basic religious values are common to all religions. In fact, those basic values in one religion are complementary to the other. Dialogue is the only way to promote better understanding between various religious communities in the democratic process. Islam came to the subcontinent in peace and has left an indelible imprint, literature and architecture, on costume and cuisine, the Sufi saints shared the spirit of mysticism and compassion that inspired the social reformist saint poets of the Bhakti movement. Buddhism, ironically, has become almost extinct in the land of its birth. Centuries before the birth of Christ, Buddhist monks had carried with them the message of peace and compassion to distant lands. They had transplanted the sapling of Indian culture in Southeast and Far Eastern Asia. Buddhist art and architecture are priceless treasures of our inheritance. From the Gompas in Ladakh, bordering the Tibetan Plateau, to the grand stoops in Central India, and the magnificent Chaityas and rock-cut caves in Deccan, those who followed the teachings of the Enlightened One have left their stunning footprints. It is difficult to comprehend how the adherence to this faith that spread like a blaze of light across the globe, a creed patronized by emperors, were reduced to a minority. The Jains who practice extreme non-violence trace the roots of their religion to antiquity, matching the origins of Buddhism. Their contributions to art and architecture, metaphysics and literature represent a rich stream comparable to any other. Sikhism was founded by Guru Nanak, who exerted to root out superstitions and to build bridges between Islam and Hinduism. His followers are taught to rise above sectarianism and build a sharing and caring community that broke barriers of caste system. The Sikhs 
participated in the vanguard of the struggle to liberate the country from foreign rule. Martyrs like Bhagat Singh are remembered gratefully. The message of Jesus Christ was brought to India by an apostle soon after he had preached it. Missionaries served suffering masses with selfless devotion. Their contributions in the field of education and health can't ever be forgotten. One must add to this list the tribal people, children of the forest and mountains. Even when their numbers were microscopic, they were not perceived as a minority. They have all contributed to the priceless heritage that is the envy of the entire world. It was only during the period of colonial rule that the foreign masters adopted a policy of divided rule and sowed the seeds of dissension among the populace. The partition of India that came with independence brought in its wake large-scale communal riots that left the nation painfully scarred. That's the reason those at the helm of the government felt it was imperative to safeguard the lives and property of the vulnerable sections of society, minorities threatened by violence. The constitution places a pre-eminent emphasis on the values of liberty and justice, on treating all citizens as equal before law, and on safeguarding the rights of the minorities and the oppressed. Democracy is the rule of majority, and the test of a genuine democracy is the space it provides for the minorities. In a plural society like ours, it is essential that everyone has the freedom to live according to one's beliefs and faith without disturbing others and is treated equally before law. This is why minorities have been granted extra protection to establish and manage their educational and cultural institutions. The public charitable trust of minority community too are governed by different laws. From schools to universities, the commission oversees that adequate safeguards are in place. You see, we are a large federal country and we have different uh, uh, provisions for different things. So it is not necessary that in a huge um, billion population uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-linguistic, uh, multicultural country, everything must be exactly the same. India accepted a framework where we said we value diversity. But there were many uh, qualifications. I think it was very clear we value diversity, religious diversity, and we want people to think they're equal partners. But we wanted to value it by acknowledging diversity of cultures and religions not making them and thinking that they are a separate group and therefore deserve political representation. This didn't come across. So that was very clear. They, and this is very different from the way diversity now tends to be accommodated when uh, other countries are thinking in terms of how to, they begin with a fixed form group and cultural identities then translate into political autonomies. 
A Minorities Commission was set up in the Home Ministry in 1978 and was in light of experience shifted to Ministry of Welfare. In 1992, this was raised to the status of an autonomous national commission. It is uh, an institution from which the government is expecting advocacy of causes. Now the advocacy may be reactive or it may be proactive. The community actually brings to our notice certain grievances, certain apprehensions, certain difficulties, and then we take that take action to try and make it move forward. If a minority feels isolated or feels different, then we give the power of the country and the power of the country, then we give the power of the majority. The majority is the work, but the government is the work of minorities and the power of the country and the power of the country. Interestingly, the definition of a minority in the fact that established the National Commission includes only five as legal minorities. The Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists and Zoroastrians. Muslims comprise the major share of the minorities in the country. I think every individual is a minority in the sense somebody is a minority some way or the other. And um, so it's a misconception that the National Commission for Minorities only belongs to the Muslim community. Fine, it is a fact that they are the biggest uh, uh, minority in India. But it does not mean that uh, uh, the Buddhist, a Buddhist or a Parsi would be deprived. Uh, of his right. The commission comprises a chairperson and five other members representing various minorities. Interestingly, it also has one member belonging to the majority community. The act which established the Minorities Commission had provisions therefore for one member of the so-called majority community. For example, an important minority like the Jains, they weren't included. And there's been a huge amount of uh, protests uh, from the Jain community. In certain states, the Jains have been included as a minority. Once the Parsis came to India, and accepted it as their homeland, they have contributed substantially in different fields. The Parsi community amongst the five minorities poses a unique challenge. The Parsi community has no, should be having no problems apart from uh, the community thinning away. That is one, and I feel that educationally, they are they are not up to it any any anymore. I mean, uh, I think I am the last direct IPS officer in the community, and I joined in 1958. We are also undertaking studies by regular scholars people who go into the sociological aspects, the population demographic matters relating to the Parsis last year and the year before last. So that was a regular study. The Parsis are a minority concentrated largely in one state, but other minorities are distributed all over the land. To safeguard their interest, state minority commissions have been established that the state commissions for minorities are going to become more active because that is certainly one weakness at present. There are certain states who don't even have minority commissions so far. So they must play their role and the, the Central Information Commission can then act as a kind of mentor and as a kind of promoter of the interests of minorities with regard to the governments of the states and the Senate. The State Minority Commission work in their domain like the National Commission for Minorities. They organize meetings and interactive sessions with the communities in need of protection. It enjoys the powers of a civil court to summon persons and documents that have a bearing on its work.
It also suggests enactment of legislation or amendment to existing legislation to benefit members of various minority communities. The Commission has played a crucial role in urging the government to adopt policies to ameliorate the conditions of the minorities, particularly those belonging to the weaker, backward sections. In people's eyes, the primary role of the Commission is to act as a watchdog of minority rights and to take cognizance of complaints of their violation. The Commission hasn't failed in its duty to protect them. Unfortunately, there have been instances where a religious or ethnic minority has been exposed to ruthless violence. No provocation can justify such acts of barbarism. Incidents like this test the mettle of the Commission. The anti-Sikh riots of 1984 in the aftermath of Srimati Indira Gandhi's assassination, posed a difficult challenge for it. As some of the accused belonged to the ruling party and were high-profile politicians. The communal carnage that flared up in Gujarat in the wake of the incident of train carriage burning in Godhra is a terrible blot on the record of Indian secularism. Innocent members of the minority Muslim community were targeted by hooligans and became victims of arson, looting, rape and murder. The state government failed to come to their rescue. Even after normalcy returned, the prosecution of those accused of inhuman crimes was tardy. The then chairperson of the commission, Justice Shamim Qureshi, toured the troubled state and presented a comprehensive report afterwards that shocked the conscience of the nation. Relief and rehabilitation of the affected were accorded highest priority. We do have the powers to go on the spot, assess uh, what's happening. And here I must say that uh, uh, in, in all the major communal troubles that have taken place in the, in the country during our uh, period in, in the Commission, uh, we were able to get a few things done. Primarily, I think, in Gujarat, we were able to highlight the fact that the rehabilitation of the post kodra riot victims uh, had, had not taken place. And I think that compelled the, the, the government to, to do something. It was the vigilance and persistence of the National Commission for Minorities that ensured that the cases were registered at the instance of the Supreme Court of India. The violence directed towards Christian missionaries in the Danks in Gujarat and in Odisha have caused nationwide pain and anguish. This too has been a matter of grave concern for the Commission. It has held hearings, recorded accounts of witnesses, and recommended remedial action. The effort has been to ensure that such incidents don't reoccur. The feeling of hostility among Hindus and Muslims, among Hindus and Christians in our country is rooted in lack of trust and understanding emanating from the baggage of colonial times and also generated by some domestic forces in recent times. Riot commissions have over the years since independence pointed out that largely riots are engineered for political gains. 
The Commission has been in the vanguard of initiating a constructive debate based on the findings of Justice Ranganath Mishra and Justice Satya reports that unveiled the glaring imbalance in representation of minorities in government service. The Satya Committee report clearly brings out that in the years since independence, the Muslim minority has not received the fruits of freedom. The main reason responsible for socio-economic backwardness of the minority communities, particularly the Muslim community, is the lack of access to common school system. The Commission is working on concrete schemes for setting up secondary and higher secondary schools in the blocks and districts having predominantly Muslim girl population. Widening of access of Muslim girls in professional education, particularly medical and engineering courses, has been a priority area of educational programs. A very large proportion of the population of minority communities is engaged in low-level technical work or earns its living as handicraftsmen. The Commission is also working on schemes that will enable the minority youths the skills which will enable them to get their legitimate due in employment both in the public sector and the private sector. The declaration of the 15-point program by the Prime Minister may be cited as a prime example of the successful advocacy undertaken by the Commission. Madarsa Modernization Program is another initiative of the Commission that provides basic educational infrastructure in areas of concentration of educationally backward minorities and resources for the modernization of Madarsa education. Schemes for pre-metric and post-metric scholarship for students from minority communities have been formulated and implemented. The National Commission for Minorities ensures that central assistance will be provided for recruitment and posting of Urdu language teachers. In the recruitment of police personnel, State governments have been advised to give special consideration to minorities. Under the schemes of integrated housing and slum development program, the central government provides assistance to states and union territories for development of urban slums through provisions of physical amenities and basic services. The Commission has ensured that the benefits of these programs flow equitably to members of the minority communities A certain percentage of the physical and financial targets under the Swarna Jayanti Gram Swarozgar Yojana have been earmarked for beneficiaries belonging to the minority communities living below the poverty line in rural areas. There are different states which have, which have different majorities. Now Punjab has a Sikh majority, but Haryana has a Sikh minority. Delhi has a Sikh minority. The rest of India has a Sikh minority. So what are, the, what, what are the Sikhs to be treated as? In, in Punjab, they will be treated as a majority, but that will be under the Act of the Punjab. At the national level, they will be treated as a minority. Sikhs, like the other scheduled minorities, are spread all over the country, and the message of Guru Nanak has touched the lives of the people everywhere. He preached communal harmony and social equity, The term minority in the Indian context is quite misleading. Legally defined minorities contain within their body sectarian minorities with a distinct identity. For instance, the Shias and Boras comprise small groups within Islam that have a personality 
and cultural traditions of their own. This commission uh, has been set up to secure the rights of the five notified minorities. There needs to be some uh, ma major changes to its charter, its mandate, to include uh, even uh, the majority as a minority where it is a minority. For instance, in Punjab, for instance, in Jammu and Kashmir, for instance, in the Northeast. If we get that kind of jurisdiction, I think that we shall be able to mobilize, we can mobilize the majority community in a big way. Those who subscribe to the Tibetan school of Buddhism have, due to accident of history, been subjected to multiple disability. The refugees from Tibet and their descendants born in India belong to an ethnic as well as religious minority with a complex set of unique problems of their own. The National Commission for Minority has been sensitive to this issue and has endeavoured to provide adequate relief through special schemes. During the Sultanate period and the Mughal rule, the common people did not identify primarily on the basis of religion. This inscription in Persian script on the gate in Burhanpur in Madhya Pradesh begins with an invocation of Ganesh, a Hindu god, believed to be the remover of all obstacles. People of different faiths still pray to their own gods together without any inhibition. The seats of Sufi saints and the mausoleums dedicated to their memory are revered by both Hindus and Muslims. Dargahs scattered all over the land bear testimony to this. This nation does not belong to any single race. It belongs to a mosaic of religiously, linguistically and culturally varied communities and we celebrate their diversity. The National Commission for Minorities endeavours to create an environment where all Indians can strive for equitable share in our nation's prosperity, transcending the religious frictions and participate in the democratic process.